I'll be starting off the presentation and it should be coming up on our screen anytime soon. Well, let me remind you of today's topic. Today's topic will be focused on effective mathematics delivery under the blended approach. And it's for grades four to six teachers. But if we have grade one to three teachers present, then that's quite okay. So let's begin with our icebreaker. It will be a game of Kahoot. So I'm going to ask that if you have your second device, if you could type in Kahoot.it and let's get started. And if you don't have a second device, if you can switch between screens on your laptop, that should be good as well. So type in Kahoot.it and we'll be providing a pin but please enter a nickname. So you're allowed to enter your nickname so we can identify you by that nickname. Also, I hope some of us at least have that coming up on our screens. So we will be answering some question displayed on this Zoom, Zoom shared screen. And each answer option on the screen is shared in, inside a box with a specific color and shape that matches the box displayed on the device being used to access the game. So your access, your device that you're using, you'll see a shape that matches the answer to the question on my share Zoom screen. So you'll click on the answer on your device for the question that matches the color or the shape shown. So you're seeing the pin for the game displayed. And so far, we have 21 participants. Let's see if we can get some more participants before we begin. We'll be closing out the participants in a few seconds. All right, so we have 51 participants. I think we can get five more seconds. All right, we can begin now. So the first question, effective mathematics. So let's go question one. Remote learning requires a learning schedule. Is that true or false? So we have a time counting down. We have all participants answering before, then we can go participants we had have, have 57 getting it correct so let's see the scoreboard we have Roxanne leading there let's go to the next question and all are through or false streaming is what happens when consumers watch tv or radio or listen to podcasts on internet connected devices Person's getting that correct, and Roxanne is still leading. Go, Roxanne. Our next question Online learning has more flexibility. Right then, so 61 
one person's getting that correct. Let's see the scoreboard. And Roxanne is still in first place with Jen second place and Tiffany, Tiffy in third. So let's go to our next question, number four. Blended learning does not give students control over the time, That is false. And let's see the scoreboard. And we have someone rising to the top. Roxanne just fell to fourth place. All right, next question. A flipped classroom is an approach where learning takes place at school and practice at home. <laughs> And we have 21 persons getting that correct. So we can go and do some research on a flipped classroom. All right, then next question, number six of 10. Teachers can build higher level critical thinking. <laughs> And the answer is false. So we have C. Dwyer moving up right there, Lynn in second, and Anna, I, I can't pronounce that name, Nevio in third place. So we can go to the next question. Conceptual learning is having the ability to transfer knowledge into new situations and apply it to new contexts. We have 65 persons getting that correct. And on the scoreboard, C. Dwyer is still in lead. Question number eight. Misconception is an opinion that is based on faulty thinking or understanding. And that's true, with 54 persons getting that correct. Let's see the scoreboard. So Mr. S I don't know if it's a Miss or a Mr. C. Dwyer is still in lead, Jen second place, and Denny in third place. All right then. Number nine. Distant learning is not feasible if students don't have access to devices or internet. So the answer is false. Okay, then. Distant learning is not feasible. So the answer there is false. Moving on to the next question. Oh, scoreboard. C. Do I are still leading? Purpose driven is as moving up there along with Tammy. All right, then. Next, final question. Blended learning combines online learning opportunities with traditional classrooms. And the final one, the answer. 
answer is true with 68 persons getting that correct. So let's see our final score. So in third place, eight out of 10, we have Tommy. Second place, C. Dwyer. And the first place, Sarkos Given. Congratulations. Congratulations to you three. And teachers, do remember that you can visit kahoot.it and find ways to involve this in your virtual classrooms. You can use it to engage your students so that your classes can be fun. Moving on, we'll look at the objectives that we'll cover in today's session. And at the end of the session, you should be able to identify possible misconceptions students may have in relationship, in relation to a concept, identify possible learning gaps associated with these misconceptions, identify possible causes of students' misconceptions, understand the importance of conceptual learning in mathematics, and finally, understand how to utilize the blended approach, synchronous or asynchronous, to teach conceptually. I now hand over to my colleague, Mrs. Cahoon, who will start, start us off with the presentation. Thank you. Mrs. Cahoon. Thank you, Ms. Bell, for leading us through the icebreaker activity and for informing our participants about the objectives for this session. So the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our lives in so many ways, and it certainly is having a negative impact on teaching and learning. So when COVID-19 entered our shores in March, we were basically plunged into a new norm. I want us to reflect a little on your experience, the different emotions you felt as you navigated this new norm. Did you feel like this concerned teacher to the left who kept asking, how will I finish the curriculum now that school is ordered closed? What about the frustrated teacher in the middle who was bombarded by the fact that her students were missing in action and that there was some struggle in regards to internet connectivity and teaching online was just so difficult for her throughout the entire process, she felt as if she couldn't bother with all of this. And so when July stepped in, she was quite relieved and happy that she had made it and now the summer break began. So now that schools have reopened, how are you really feeling? Are you having a deja vu moment? Or are you in a better place now as you seek to engage the students once again? I want you to share your responses in the chat so that we can get an understanding as to how you are feeling. You can also indicate by raising your hand and I will allow at least one person to share exactly how they are feeling at this time. Okay, Ms. Bill, is there anything in the chat? Yes. I am seeing in the chat person, Damalia Damal Matthews saying teacher number one, two, one, three. A person saying number two, Shana White is saying one and two, Maria one and three. So we have mixed results coming in. Okay, so I see that some teachers are still feeling confused and frustrated, but I'm going to assure you that um, if you put God first in all of this situation, I'm sure that He will take you through, and at the end, you will have 
a lot of things to be grateful for. And at the end, also, you'll be able to celebrate the different successes that your students um, would have achieved. Now, so COVID-19 came and actually took over Jamaica and brought about many challenges. So these challenges had a negative impact on teaching and learning, right? I want us to now look at how, how was mathematics teaching and learning affected? So there were missed opportunities for learning and there was a creation of learning gaps and misconceptions. There was some uncertainty about teaching meaningfully online. And so a number of teachers would have resorted to um, the use of worksheets. Now, how do we move forward and bridge this gap? I want you to consider these three points. The first one is identify learning gaps from the diagnostic assessments. I want us to also review the curriculum and merge objectives from previous grade with current grade and prepare a scope and sequence. And I'm encouraging us all to teach conceptually using the 5E model and mathematical practices to avoid further misconceptions and to bridge this gap. As we delve a bit deeper into the presentation, I now hand over to Ms. Stephanie Deer, who will take us through the next segment of the presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Fogun. Now, we are currently administering the diagnostic assessment. So here is a scenario. Um, we are doing it at grade six. It was administered at grade six. So we know that then the objectives would have been taken from grade five. So the strand we're looking at is measurement. And the objective is develop relationship between units of length and unit of area. And this is a term to objective at the DOK level two. So let's look at the item. So this item says the length of, length of one side of the squares is two centimeters. What is the area of the figure? Now, after the assessment, this is the sample assessment summary. So these, this would reflect the responses of the students. Now, as you can see, we have some levels. So we have level one, level two, level three, and level four. Earlier, we had said DOK2, so I don't want us to be confused with DOK and the levels. So we know DOK at level one, recall, level two, concepts, and level three, strategic, and so forth. But for the levels now that we are currently looking at, it refers to the level of understanding that the students portrayed while doing the assessment. Now, from what we have seen here is that at level one, the students multiplied two times six without considering the concept embedded in the question. And that was 25% of the students. At level two, students counted the squares and they did not apply the knowledge of the length. At level three, students found the area of three of the, horizon, of the three horizontal squares and the area of the four vertical squares. But, and they also found the sum but you would have realized that in so doing, they found um, the air of one of the squares two times. And at the level four now, this is where the students would have gotten it correct because students understand the concept of area and how the length of the square impacts on the area of the figure. Now, 
let, if you have just say one grade six class, say about 20 students, or you may have four grade six classes at your school, approximately 200 students, then this would have been a worrying factor because here we're seeing that the percentage score for level one is 25, for level two is 55, level three 15, and only 5% would have got, um, gotten the question correct. Now, you may be saying, well, it was COVID and so forth and so forth. But even in the case when we didn't have COVID, this would have been a reflection of some of the um, items. Now, at level one, why, why they are listed in the different levels, at level one, the students do not really understand what is happening. What they do is really make a guess. So they're neither here nor there, they will just do an operation. Whether the addition, subtraction, they don't care because they don't know, they just don't know. At level two, they would have a little understanding, but they are unsure. And sometimes at this level, they are very confused and cannot make the application. At level three, they can do a little, and if they follow the example that teacher do in class most times, and the questions are posed that particular way, they are able to solve the question, but they do not fully grasp the concept. At a level four now, this is where they say, yes, I got it. They can even teach their classmate um, the concept. And so they, they show an understanding of what is being taught. Now, as teachers, looking at the 25% score, there, this is where the bulk of the students are. Now, this is very troubling because at level two, the students are, when you're in class and you are revising, if you have a chance to revise, these are the students who would say, Mr. I'm not so slow, or sir, let's do this teacher. Teacher, I'm not so slow, you know, but it's just that, me never sure, I mean, they get a little confused. So in truth and in fact, they are not really slow, but was the concept taught to these students, all right? So we want to, we want here, from here on, we want to be conscious. We want to be purposeful in what we do, in, in ensuring that when we're teaching, we teach conceptually. So, if you can see the pit, we are looking at two hills, if you in mountains, and we see a gap. Uh, on one side, we have misconceptions, we have learning gaps. There is the bridge, and then we have conceptual understanding. No, I don't know if the gap is too wide for you or it's too close. I don't know if the bridge looks strong enough, but will you accept the challenge? Will you accept the challenge to move from, to take the students from having the misconceptions or the learning gaps and to carry them where they will have conceptual understanding? Do we see the gap? And the word we have there is perceivable. Is it a perceivable gap? Will you accept the challenge? Now, before we, 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 we continue further on, let us look at the misconception versus the learning gaps, because we want, we want to differentiate between the two. So, a misconception is a conclusion that's wrong because it's based on faulty thinking. While, and that's from Lerman 2014, while the learning gaps are, are the disparities between what a child has actually learned and what he or she was expected to learn at a particular age or grade level. Cuttlefish 2016. So from the, the scenario presented, what do you think? Was it a misconception or it was a learning gap? You can type your responses in the chat, please, so we can hear your views. Now, we have shown um, 
the item again and, and the responses, the summary of the students' responses, just for you to view so you can decide. All right. Moving along. I'm here. Yes, Miss Bailey. I am yet to see any response coming but, in. Okay. From As we go along, they would decide. The teachers will decide if it was a misconception or a learning gap. So, what are the possible causes of the misconceptions or learning gaps identified in the scenario? So, probably you're saying the teacher did not adequately cover the concept. Or the math curriculum does not cover the, co the concept enough, in enough depth. The pace of the math lesson was too fast. The child learned to solve problems using an algorithm, but lacks conceptual understanding. Or you may be saying outside factors are causing the child stress, and so they cannot focus in class. For example, a family member having COVID. And you would all have been correct. These are possible causes of misconceptions or learning gaps. However, Ms. Dare, are you hearing me? Yes, Ms. Bailey. Let me just share some responses coming in. Yes. In the chat. So I'm seeing where quite a number of persons are saying both. Yes. We have uh, Marvett Brown saying it is a learning gap or misconception. Wright is also saying learning gap, and mm -hmm. persons are saying both. Yes. And you are so yeah, correct. One or two persons say misconception. Yes. Well, you would know, um, you know your school, you know your students, so you would have known what had happened in your school or at your school. So for some persons, it might be one or the other. For other persons, it will be both. So we are all correct. So moving forward, how do we bridge the gap? Because I'm sure you recall that, that gap, a uh, uh, scary gap. Now, as was mentioned earlier, we said um, we need to identify the learning gaps from the di diagnostic assessment, All right? Then we need to merge the objectives from previous grades with current grade and prepare a scope and sequence. And last, we need to teach conceptually using the 5E models. And I know we all know about it and mathematical practices to avoid further misconceptions and to bridge the gap. Okay, thank you colleagues. I now hand over to Miss Bell who will do a poll. Thank you, Miss Dyer. So now we'll be launching a poll. So a poll will pop up on your device. And the question is, what was the greatest challenge experienced while teaching students remotely. So we know that there were many challenges. However, we selected the one that caused the greatest challenge to put on this poll. So we'll have this poll run for about a minute before we close it. So let's see how many responses we can get before the minute is up. So again, what was the greatest challenge experienced while teaching students remotely? So far, we have over 70 persons responding. So 20 seconds to go. Another 10 seconds. So I'll be ending the poll. No. All right. So we have 161 persons participating in the poll. And please do remember that there are way more challenges than what we are seeing 
coming up on our screens, but we choose to poll the, the greater challenges. And of the 161 persons doing the poll, we have 72% persons saying students with no access to Wi-Fi our devices with data plan. So right there we saw that that one was the greatest challenge of all. And we have 14% saying students not completing assignments. Another 5% unstable Wi-Fi for the teachers. 5% um, uncertainty regarding teaching certain concepts online. So teaching certain concepts online was a challenge here and three percent saying insufficient printed materials for students without internet access so there we're seeing the poll right there all right so we're going to stop sharing that now moving on Challenges experienced with distant learning contributes to students' misconception. Are you in agreement with that? You can put your comment in the chat. Miss Bailey will let us know what is happening there. So these challenges, we know that there are many challenges, but these problems include the quality of instruction. Were teachers instructing the students in the way that conceptual understanding could take place. We know we were no longer in the classroom, so perhaps many of us as teachers did not know how to instruct students virtually. We also had hidden courses, such as buying data plans. Many students probably have the device, but they don't have any Wi-Fi or they can't access the data. And I know that some teachers face the same challenges as well. The misuse of technology. How many students have the devices, but instead of being in classes, they'd rather be playing some games, probably on TikTok or something else, but they misuse the devices. Also the attitudes of the teachers and students. As we know, some attitudes were just, some persons were just not in the frame of mind for the online teaching. And as we can see some of that happening right now with the beginning of school. But do remember each of these have an effect on the overall quality of distant learning and how we get the students to understand conceptually. And in many ways, they're interconnected in more ways than one. And Miss Bell? In response to your question, persons, many persons have been saying yes. Andrea Brown is saying definitely as many teachers were uncomfortable teaching remotely, and this came out in the lesson delivery, and Mattis is saying time management. All right, thank you. But remember, with anything that is new, there is always uncertainty. But let's go with this with an open mind. I don't think any of us are 100% ready for this new virtual learning, you know, but if we're open mind towards it, I'm sure we'll be able to learn a lot of things. And even with all the ups and downs, we still have to get the students ready to be 21st century learners and equip them with the correct skills. So therefore, we need to play our part and do our best to get them ready for the 21st century. All right, moving on. What is conceptual learning? So we've been talking about conceptual learning. What is conceptual learning? Any comment in the chat? Or you can raise your hand and Miss Bailey will unmute you. Can we okay. have an individual? I have a raise hand from LV Moody. So okay. I'm going to be unmuting you now, Moody. So you've been asked to unmute Moody, go ahead.
You'll have to accept to unmute. So you have to unmute your mic, Mr. Moody. All right, seem to be having some challenges. Let me try. Go ahead, Moody. Can we, any other volunteer? And again, with technology, we have to. Okay, so I have Yvette Hunter unmuted. Okay, all right, Yvette. I think, good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. I think conceptual learning is the child fully understanding the concept in such a way that it is not learned rote and the child will be able to put it or break it down into his or her own words and will be able to share that understanding with another learner. Thank you, Miss Yvette. And that's indeed correct. Uh, also, this is learning that involves understanding and interpreting concepts and the relationship between the concepts. So we see what Miss Yvette was saying here where children can grasp ideas in a transferable way that can help them take what they learned in the classroom and apply it across the mains. So this is Aslar 2010. And we know that we, don't want, we want what the students learn within the math class, they can transfer that to other subject areas or also help them in their everyday life. So this is what conceptual learning is. Ms. Bell, let me just share a definition given here by Sashana White. So she's saying conceptual learning involves students engaged in quality learning experiences based around key concepts and central ideas rather than using the more traditional method of focusing on learning on topics. Thank you, Ms. White. So Teaching mathematics conceptually, what are some points that we need to consider? So we need to consider the visual models. And this we can link back to SMP 4 and 5. Can anyone quickly state what is SMP 4 and 5? We would have focused on this last year as a math team. Can anyone state what is SMP 4 and 5? You can raise your hand and Miss Bailey will unmute you. We have no responses, Miss Bailey. No response. Okay, so SMP 4 states that we model with mathematics and 5 use appropriate tools strategically. So with the visual models, we'll have them modeling and using the tools appropriately. So we should consider these things when teaching mathematics conceptually, using, when, using, when teaching for understanding, students need visual representations. So in our face-to-face -face classroom, we normally have the resources that we would use and ranging from discrete physical objects or pictures to continuous models that have attributes of length, distance, and area. Another point to consider when teaching mathematics conceptually is the language and discourse. And this we can go back to link to SMP number three, which says construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. So this, are, this is what we want students to be doing. And when they're doing this, we are teaching conceptually. A conceptual approach encourages students to share and explain to their peers and connect and a connection, the connection, sorry, they see between and among mathematical concepts. This provides a necessary opportunity for students to build their understanding of concepts by discussing and justifying their own thinking and by evaluating other students' thinking 
in constructive and supportive setting. So we don't want them to just be saying, yes, I agree with her, but why do they agree with her? Or why don't they agree? They should be able to defend their answers. So moving on. Teaching conceptually face to face. So when we were in the classroom and teaching face to face, we provide opportunities for experimentations with hands-on learning. So we have the resources as stated before, we'll be using the Dean's blocks, the counters, the geo board and so much more. Discussion and sharing of different perspectives guided by the teacher. So as said before, we were using the math language within the classroom, the discourse, and of course it was guided by the teacher. So we don't have the students strain from the point. And students progress from the concrete to the pictorial and clearly seeing the bridge to the abstract. So we're linking back that to SMP four and five again, as stated before. Now when teaching concept, with concept to, uh, when we're teaching online, now that we're online, and we need to provide conceptual understanding. We know that our classroom will not be the same as face to face. So how can we achieve conceptual learning on our online classes? So these are some things we need to consider. Set realistic expectations for yourself and your students we would have written lesson plans that we could have covered within the 60 minutes when we were face to face but can we cover so much well online when we're doing the online sessions ensure that you set realistic expectations design your classroom using the available online tools so we have the zoom we have the google classroom Google Docs, SMS, and some of us might be using WhatsApp, but there are many. So design your classroom. Coordinate with your colleagues to use similar tools will allow you to support one another. So build a system within your school where you can learn from each other, collaborate with each other. What if they learn something online that they can teach you? What if you learned? So some of us learned how to mark via WhatsApp last term. Teach your fellow colleague how to do that. Other points to consider are developing learning activities. So we can also develop learning activities. And there is a lot of site online. In this time and age, we have to do a lot of research. So research is key. We have to learn how to manage the new norm. So we'll have to develop learning activities. We also have to ensure that we communicate clearly with our students. So if you're going to send out a voice note, ensure that the voice note states exactly what you expect of the students. If you're going to write a message, ensure that it is deliberate and it's aligned with what you want from the students. And also if you're going to use videos, ensure that you watch the videos before you send them out or post them for the students and ensure that it, it doesn't give out too much information that you more than what you want the child to get from the video. So ensure again that the videos are deliberate they are vetted and they are aligned with the learning goals. Also, we have to rethink the means of assessment. We no longer can sit down in class with the paper and pen. So how are we going to assess the students now? Now that we are using the LMS, the Google Suite, we can now explore with it. We have Google Forms, Google Sheets, 
So we can go there and make our tests online. We can go and search for websites that will allow us to make our worksheets. So this time and age requires for us to do a lot of research. Now we're going to be doing another poll and I now invite Mrs. Cahoon to take us through that poll. Thank you so much, Ms. Bell. And now we embark on another poll. And this time we're looking at what are the different platforms that were used or what will be used to support distance learning. Now the poll is launched. Let's see how you respond to this one. So the numbers are going up. We have almost 100 persons responding so far. The poll will close in another 20 seconds. So far we have almost 200 persons responding. The poll will close in the next five seconds. Now let us look at the results. So out of the total number of participants, we have 67 persons, which is 35% saying that they're going to be using the learning management system. We have 67% saying Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, and 73% of Participants saying they will be using the Google Classroom. That's good. 82% um, said they'll be using WhatsApp and 51% said printed materials. We also have 6% of participants saying other. I'm quite curious to hear what those other means of engagement will be. I ask you to place um, um, that information in the chat so that the other teachers can get an idea as to other means of engagement that they can utilize. Thank you so much for participating in the poll. Now, teaching mathematics conceptually using the blended approach. What do we mean by blended learning? I want you to share your responses in the chat to get us to have an understanding as to what you are thinking in regards to blended learning. What is it, what is it really about? Uh, Mrs. Cahoon? Yes, Ms. Bailey? Just backtrack a bit. Um, so persons have been offering some alternatives to the responses that were given. So yes. some persons are saying they could use SMS local calls. There is someone here who has a list. Somebody saying Jamboard, Class yes. Dojo, Nearpod, Class Maker, is that it? test portals for assessment and so on. So persons have their different ways to reach the students. Yes, wonderful. And there is a wide variety of options out there, but what we want to encourage you to do is to use whichever modality to teach the students in a conceptual way. Now, do we have anyone respond responding to what blended learning is all about? So we have a response, Wendy Mitchell is saying blended. So she's giving hers in the form of an equation, I guess. So blended is equal to physical and virtual. Um, and that's Williams Nelson is saying online teaching and face-to-face. -face. And Brown is saying face-to-face -face and online. Yes, and indeed, 
you are all correct. And this is supported by Bunk and Graham 2005, who describes blended learning as a combination of face-to-face -face and online instruction. Now, in regards to blended learning, we have two approaches. The first one that we look at is the synchronous approach. So within this approach, we have um, learning in which the learners and instructors are in the same learning space at the same time. And students go through the learning path together and their teacher is there to guide them through the learning process to ensure that they complete tasks and activities. And this is put forward by FINAL 2020. Now, let's look at what the asynchronous approach is. On the other hand, this is a premise that learning can occur in different times, spaces, particular to each learner, and the learners are able to function at their own pace. So there's no restriction here in regards to the asynchronous approach. Now teaching conceptually using these different needs. We have, um, we can utilize Zoom lessons, Microsoft Teams, Google Meets, Google Classroom, WhatsApp, and also all the other options given by the teachers a short while, other teachers a short while ago. We also can utilize printed materials. What I want you to do at this point is to tell me which of these you think would be synchronous as opposed to asynchronous. And you can place your responses in the chat or you can indicate by raising your hand and we'll have you unmute and share with us. All right, so far, Matthews is saying that printed would be asynchronous. Jones Williams saying printed materials, but I'm not seeing which of the two categories that one will be placed. Cheddar, asynchronous would be the papers, and Williams Nelson is also agreeing that printed material would be asynchronous. Thank you so much, Miss Bailey. Do we have any that could be both? So we have more responses coming in. There are persons who are giving examples of synchronous. They're saying Zoom and Google, Google Meet. And someone is saying that Zoom can be both, printed can be both, and uh, WhatsApp as well. Um, Thank you. So hand raise, Cheddar. Let me invite you to unmute. Yes, I couldn't type at all. Um, I was saying Google Me could be both asynchronous and synchronous because it depends on how you do your set your lesson in there. So it can be both asynchronous or or synchronous. It could be asynchronous in the fact that you um you could give them a what name a PowerPoint a PowerPoint and they, that they would have to read and they would have to be able to understand in order to complete the task or maybe you give them a reading to do and complete it. It could also be um, synchronous by you having them read a thing but at the same time you also put a question in the screen for them to answer. So in a sense you're getting their feedback while whilst you're doing it, or you could create a cre an interactive PowerPoint. Thank you so much. And I agree with you. So as long as the teacher and the students are having a live moment, they are able to interact with each other. Students are able to answer questions in real time. Then that approach is synchronous. All right, so now, teaching conceptually using Zoom, Google Meet, or Microsoft Teams. So we're going to be looking at these as synchronous approaches to learning. Now, how can this teaching experience be meaningful? 
we can use short student friendly interactive PowerPoint. We can also utilize um, virtual manipulatives and games, as well as videos and illustrations. And we can allow students to interact within the classroom. So we have students sharing, they're able to critique the reasoning of others instead of just answering yes or no. This is also a platform in which we can see the mathematical practices coming out as well. Now we're going to be engaging in a task where we explore the area concept. And again, we're looking at the synchronous approach. Now, these are the objectives that will guide this section. We're going to look at use a square grid, one centimeter square, to find the area of any shape. And this is taken from the grade four curriculum term two. The second one we want to look at is how to find the area of various objects and figures. Again, grade four term two. And the third one is to develop relationships between units of length and units of area. And this is taken from grade five term two. Now you might be wondering, how comes we have grade four objectives and a grade five objective? Remember, as was suggested in the first workshop that was held with the principals, we suggested the merging of objectives in order to bridge the gaps created. Now let us look at this task. This is a task that, task that we can use to engage our students by this medium in order to get them to, to speak and to share their responses. Now let us look at it and you're going to assume the role of a student and you're going to respond as if you were your, your student. All right, so this grid gives a more accurate measure of the size of the sheet. Which grid gives, sorry, which grid gives a more accurate measure of the size of the shape? And I want you to justify your response. Is it grid A or is it grid B? Again, I ask you to place your responses in the chat or you can indicate by raising your hand and we allow you to speak. Okay, Mrs. Cahoon, we have quite a number of responses in the chat and everyone is saying grid B. Okay, so persons are saying grid B. I want, remember that you are to be justifying your response. So I want you to tell me why you think grid B gives a more accurate measure of the size of the sheet. Andrea Allen is saying grid B because there are no spaces between the squares. And uh, Marlene Parker is saying grid B, which is more consistent. Um, Wendy Bent, grid B because there is greater space coverage. And uh, Mitchell, grid B since there are squares and area is recorded in square units. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kind Simpson is saying squares are easier to count. Thank you. So someone else. I think yes, someone please go ahead. Is saying that because the question stipulated square units. That was it. The chat is moving so quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks all for responding. And you are all correct. Now we want to move to our next activity and we want to find the area of shapes by counting squares. Now we, we will be using a virtual manipulative to help us to explore this idea. When we go to our virtual manipulative we will be recreating the shapes shown on the right on this virtual geoboard and we will be counting squares to find the area of the shapes. Let's go. So give me a minute as I get this virtual manipulative up.
Okay. Are you seeing it now? Yes, we're able to see your screen. Okay. Now, so this is a virtual geoboard. Now, before we go to representing the shapes on this geoboard, I want to let you be aware of how to utilize this geoboard itself. If you look to the bottom of your screen, the, to the left, you would have noticed that there are different types of board that you can utilize based on the activity that you're doing. At this point, we're using the square board. Next to it, we have the rectangle board that looks like that. We also have a circle board that we can utilize if we wish. Going along, we have the grid that we, we by selecting it, we, we have lines coming up on the board itself. Going across where you see that T, that gives us um, an opportunity to write. So if we want to make reference to a question, we could probably type it there and have it next to the board itself. Now, beside that T, we have our drawing tools. That also gives us a chance to annotate on the virtual board. You can also note, you also notice a trash um, right there, a symbol for um, delete. If you have made a mistake and you want to remove that from the board, that also is an option for you. Now let us get back to our activity and we're going to be using our square board for this one. So let's select that one. Now we have our grid up. All right, so below your grid, you would have noticed that there are some elastic bands. These are um, these elastic bands we use to assist us in drawing our shapes. So what you do basically is to click and drag whichever elastic band you want to use. For this shape that I'm going to represent, I am going to be using a number of different colors just to let it look attractive. So let's go. Are you seeing what's happening? All right, so I'm choosing another color. Now I'm representing the shape, selecting another color here. So let's use this one. And you basically click and drag and drag it to wherever you want it. Let's use another color. And we basically drag it to wherever it is that we want to place it. Okay, so that's the shape that we are working with. I want you to now tell me the area of this shape. And I want you to tell me the strategy that you would have used to arrive at this area. Miss Bailey, do we have anyone responding? Not as yet. All right, so we just got one. I won't attempt to pronounce the name, but the person is saying 3.5 units. Pike is saying three and a half squares. Persons are saying three and a half units as well. Some more responses are coming in and I'm seeing here somebody saying eight. Person saying that you're counting the squares and we continue to get responses of 3.5 square units. Okay, thank you so much, Miss Bailey. Let us look to see if these responses are indeed correct. So now we're going to be using our annotate tool. So we want to count the squares together. Let us start with the whole squares. So right here we have one. So this is what you can also do. Annotate to let the students see what is really happening. Here we have a second one, we call in that two. Now what happens here? 
we have two half squares. So what happened here? What, what do we tell the students at this point? Do we have anyone responding in the chat, Miss Bailey? Okay, so Bert Brown is saying count half squares. Someone else is saying two halves become one. And we have some more comments saying two halves make one. Thank you so much. And that's correct. So these two half squares will give us the third one. And then we have a half of a square right here. So this therefore means that the area of this figure is three and a half squared units. So remember to stress the fact that we're looking at the area concept and the students need to represent this answer in terms of squared units. Okay, let us go back to the presentation. Are you seeing my screen once again? Yes, we are seeing your screen. Okay, so we want to revisit the diagnostic assessment task. Just to refresh our memories, the length of one side of the squares is two centimeter. What is the area of the figure? What I want us to do now is to provide me with some questions that we could ask students for them to find the area of the figure without using a formula. All right, Mrs. Cahoon, we have a hand raised, Nicola Mattis Allen, so I'm going to unmute her so that she can speak. Okay, go ahead. I've sent the request for you to unmute, Nicola. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Mrs. Cohoon. I was um, giving a, um, a reflection, giving a response to the first task that was done a while ago. I was thinking in order for the students to understand how we got the three and a half, I would have taken the two half drawn the, 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 the half shapes that were on the left side and show them yeah. how that, they could be placed together to make one. That would be for the visual learners. Yes, and that is an excellent idea. I love that. I really love that. That works. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so now back to our question. I want you to tell me what are some questions we could ask students for them to find the area of the figure without using a formula. Do we have any responses as yet, Miss Bailey? Uh, no, I'm not seeing. I think Christy Richard is saying, count the number of squares to arrive at the answer. But that wasn't a question. I'm not seeing any responses to your last question. Okay. Let us look at some possible questions that you can ask. The first one is, how many unit squares are contained within each squares of the figure? How do you know? Draw lines on the figure to show these unit squares and find the area of the figure. And at this point, teachers can allow students to use the annotate tool. Now, there are some other questions that you could have asked. So these are just two options. Now, how could a virtual manipulative assist with this? And we're going to be exploring once again using a, a link to one such virtual manipulative. Now, when we get there, we will be recreating the shape once again. And we will identify the unit squares within each square of the figure. And we want to find the area of the figure by counting the squares. And we want to relate this to a formula. All right, so let's go to our virtual manipulative once again. Give me a few seconds to get that up. Okay. 
Are you able to see it now? Yes, Corinne is up, we're seeing. Okay, I'm going to get it a bit bigger for you to see. And let me close off this advertisement here. All right, zoom it up a little. Oh, it's too big this time. All right, I hope you can see it quite clearly. Now, as can be seen here below the grid, there are some squares that we can use to drag onto our grid to represent or to recreate the shape that we are focusing on. Now I'm going to be using a different color square for the larger squares making up the figure. All right, let's go. And I want you to observe what is happening and to tell me how useful this virtual manipulative is in order to um, assist students to identify unit squares within this um, each square of this figure. All right, let's go. Let me start from the top since we want the shape to fill up the board. And this virtual manipulative, you can see it, it, it gives you the area and the perimeter that you see up there to the, at the top, top left. So it gives that option as well. And you can even hide it if you don't want it to be there. All right, so there we go. Oops. So I'm going to have to put back another square up here. All right. Let's keep going. Then I need another color. Let's choose this one. All right, do you notice anything? You can place your responses in the chat. And then we have the final. All right, so I want you to tell me how useful this Virtual manipulative could be in assisting the students to identify the unit squares of in the larger square of this figure. Do we have any responses in the chat, Miss Bailey? No, we don't have any responses, but there are persons saying that they like the manipulative and it's very interactive and quite interesting. And Angus just replied saying four unit squares represent a two by two square. Excellent, excellent point. All right, so there we see that we have the four unit squares within each of these larger square, which is a two by two square. And at this point, we can get the students to count these unit squares for each of these um, squares making up the figure. So highlighting each of these squares will allow the students to see these unit squares. What you have to do now is to just tap on that square and, and it highlights it. So they can count as they go up or down or whichever direction you're taking them. They can count the squares, the unit squares within and see what's really happening. So you click on each and you see where it highlights. And at that point, they can really appreciate um, how to find the area of the figure by counting the squares. I want you to now tell me how after doing this, how can you now relate it to the use of a formula? Do we have anyone responding, Miss Bailey? Not as yet. So at this point, we can reinforce the idea that the unit squares formed within this um, square of the making of the figure 
is also related to the length of the squares itself. Mrs. So Cop we have, yes, Miss Bailey? We have a hand that is raised. Okay, allow her to unmute Cheddar. and share with us. Ked, are you there? Yes, I was saying they, we could prompt them to identify that there are squares being made and then from that allow them to realize how many um, square, how many blocks we had used to make each square going lengthwise and widthwise. Yes, that's a good idea. And also to relate that fact to um, the length of this, the large square itself. Okay, so thank you so much for participating as we explore this virtual manipulative. It is really quite useful. And as we seek to engage students using the different online platforms, we can utilize these virtual manipulative to enrich the learning experience. Okay. I will now go back to PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Now, this is a task that we're not going to be solving this one at the moment, but I'm suggesting this as a task that can be given to the students after they would have understood the area concept and understood how to um, find the area of shapes such as squares or even rectangles. A question like this can be given to them. And again, their learning experience can be enriched with the use of a virtual manipulative. So they can use this virtual manipulative to represent the question itself and also to assist them in solving the question. Now we go to teaching conceptually using the Google Classroom. And at this point, I hand over to Ms. Ornella Bell, who will take us through this segment of the presentation. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Thank you Mrs. Cahoon. So we just went through teaching conceptually and we're using Zoom. So that was a area there. Now we're going to be looking at teaching conceptually using Google Classroom. And I do remember that some teachers did highlight that they, are, they will be using the Google Classroom. And with the learning management system, we know that Google is one of the main features. Google Classroom is one of the main features there. And we can teach conceptually using the Google Classroom. And how can this experience be meaningful? because we do want it to be meaningful to the students. And here is how we can make it meaningful. What we can do is utilize the manipulatives and games. So the same Kahoot that we used at the beginning, we can utilize that within our Google Classroom. Also the same manipulatives that Mrs. Kahoon just carried us through, let us explore we can utilize those within our Google Classrooms as well. Let's utilize videos and illustrations, and I cannot overemphasize the importance of vetting the videos before we put them in our classrooms, making them deliberate and aligned with the learning goals ensure that the videos you're sending out in your classroom for the students to view that they're aligned with the goals that you want them to achieve are these video videos meeting the objectives i am setting out to achieve for my students to achieve today ensure you ask yourself these questions we don't want them to be more than what the students are supposed to get from them. So ensure that even if you find a video and it has more than what you want, you can clip the video. We'll be sharing resources within the chat that you can use to develop your Google Classroom and your virtual or online teaching space. So please ensure that you 
view the chat to copy the links that we will be sharing. Also, utilize links to contents, videos such as YouTubes, Google Docs. There is so much that we can do. I will be sharing my screen with you now so that we can explore Google Classroom together. So please allow me to share my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. All right, thank you. So right here, this is our classroom, my Google, our Google Classroom, and it's entitled Grade 5 Mathematics Content. So right here, we have the class code. So if you have Google Classroom on your phones, you can enter the code and it will take you there as a student and as a teacher what you can do one way to send out the code to students is to go to people and you can add your students click on this icon here and you you'll get a link there that you can send out and you can type the students email address and send it out to them what if you're doing it via whatsapp what you can do is copy the link and send it via WhatsApp. So that's how you send out an invite to students with, to get to your class. Also, do remember that you are to create a circle, a system among yourself as teachers. So you can also invite co-teachers within your classroom. And the same can be done if you want them as teachers. Click on the add person right there and add them as teachers. So that's how we add persons to our classroom. So going back to our classroom, what you want to do is have your classroom organized. Remember you are primary school teachers, hence you'll be looking at various subject areas and we don't want the subjects to be mixed. So we don't want them to read in one here. We have a math instruction, then we have a science instruction. So what you can do when you're going to lay out a lesson is write the outline for the lesson. So right there you're seeing the outline of the lesson, the date. So we can always go back to see the date. Right there we have date, which is today's date. Thursday, October 8, 2020. And we welcome the students to our classroom. Remember, not all of them will be able to access your live sessions. So what you want to do is create a space for the students. So even if they can't access those live sessions, they can self-direct and learn conceptually. So even without you, they should be able to maneuver and go through timely and understand conceptually what is happening. So as you can see on our layout for the lesson, we have a quote. So remember math is fun and you can do it. So ensure that your classroom is designed how you want it to design. And in today's class, we'll be exploring the area concept and finding the area of plain shapes. So what I have laid out there are the objectives. What are we going to do step by step? So you can do that within your classroom. What are we going to do first? First, we're going to be viewing a video depicting the error concept, followed by completing a Google form to help us have an understanding of what you learned from watching the video. Third, we're going to be using a virtual manipulative which will aid with finding the area of plain shapes. And I see Marvet has already joined. Hi, Marvet. And fourth, we'll be completing a task on the area concept 
finally we'll be doing a worksheet. So let's go. Let's see if we have things in order there. So right there, we click right there. We go to the instruction and right there we can see our video and we can see our Google form there. So allow me to share the sound. So ensure that if you're on a Zoom meeting and you're going to play something with the intent of the students hearing it, you also have to share the system sound. Because if you don't do that, then they won't be hearing what's taking place on your system. So when I click there, it takes me to my video. Good day, class. Today we will be exploring the area. I hope concept. you're hearing. Please state in the chat Our if you're hearing. Our for today, by the end of this you're lesson, you should be able okay. to use a square grid to find the area of any shape and to find the area of rectangles. Let's first explore the area concept. Look carefully at these grids. What is the same? What is different? If you are thinking that there are spaces between the circles on the circular grid and that there are no spaces between the squares on the other grid, you are correct. Now, which grid is able to give a more accurate measure of the region enclosed within the shape? Is it grid A or is it grid B? If you are thinking that it's grid B, then you are indeed correct. The square grid is able to give a more accurate measure of the region enclosed within the shape because there are no spaces between the squares and the squares can be counted to tell the size of the shape in square units. Counting the squares gives the area of the shape. Now we will go into this activity where we will find the area of these shapes by counting the squares. Let's try to find the area of shape A. How many squares are enclosed within that shape? Let's count them together. We have one square here. We have another one here, let's call that two. In all, another one gives us three, and then we have another one, so we have four squares in all. So, the area of figure A is four square units. What about shape B? What do you notice? All right, then. So we'll stop there. Please do search within your chat as we will be posting the link as to where you can go and make your video. Because as you can hear, that was Mrs. Cahoon's voice there. She did, we did a PowerPoint and then do a video for it. So we will post the link within the chat where you can go ahead and make your own video. So after the students watch that video, then they'll be completing a Google form. And please make use of Google form. So right there we have a form. As you can see, they'll enter their name, what is area, what unit is area measured in so they would have watched the video 
and based on watching the video, they'll be able to answer the questions. So we want to find out what did they garner from watching the video. And as I said, you use Google Forms to make your own. And right after they'll submit the form. So they'll submit it and you'll get it back as the teacher. We're moving on, we're going back to the classroom. So going back to the classroom, the next thing the students will be asked is using a virtual manipulative, which will aid with finding the area of plane shapes. So right here, and this is something that the students can maneuver for themselves. So we make it friendly for them as students. So they go right there and they'll click on the tab there and it'll take them right there. So the question says, what is the area of the gray shape? And before we continue, can we see in the chat where, can you tell me how many of the green squares it would take to cover the gray one? So can we have some suggestions before we do it? Ms. Daly, any comment in the chat? Right, so we have one response. Somebody saying 12, 10, 8, 12, 10. So those are the options I'm seeing, 8, 12, and 10. All right, so let's go, let's see. All the students will have to do is drag the green shape there onto the gray one. We have a 20 as well, Miss Bell. 20 as well, we'll see. So far we have two. Three. And if you do change your answer, let Miss Bailey know. Just type it in the chat. I'm now seeing 14. Okay. 16. So far we have six. So right there we used 12, so 12. So therefore the area of the gray shape would be 12 square units. So as you can see, this is student friendly and they can maneuver it by themselves. And again, we go back to our classroom, the next task asked us to complete a task on area concept. So as you can see, we have everything flowing within our classroom. So the students do not have to overthink, where do I go to find this task now? What am I supposed to do? We have everything flowing there. And once they click and go to instruction, they'll find their worksheet. And as soon as they're completed, so it's the same question that we saw with the sandbox. And of course, they can use the different virtual manipulatives that we would have introduced them to, to help solve the question. And after completing it, they'll be given the option to turn in the work where it will be sent to the teacher. So they'll be given the option to turn in the work. And then we have a sample worksheet. Remember, not all of our students will be able to be online. So at the same time as teachers, while we'll be focusing online, we'll have to be doing some printed materials for the students who we can't reach online or virtually. So do ensure that you share your worksheets within your classroom as well. So you can give them your worksheet as homework that they can use. We'll go through this worksheet later on when we look at the printed materials. 
what if things are not in place within your classroom? How can I go about putting things in place? All right then. So we have these three icons here. What if I want to move my sample worksheet to the top of my class? All I have to do right there is cl click on the three dots there and it moves it to the top. So with that moved, as you can see right here, it's now at the top. With my last thing at the top, I can know that I can then move what would come before that. So I know before that I would have my task on area to complete. So all I have to do is now move the task to the top of the classroom. Miss Bell. Go ahead. We have a question, Paulette Newsom. Okay. Paulette. Are you there, Paulette? I'm trying to unmute you. All right, go ahead, Paulette. Paulette, are you there? All right, continue, Miss Bill. All right, so until we get to Paulette, so we can continue organizing the items until we have everything in order and they are arranged how we want them to be arranged. But please remember to have an instruction that tells the students and tells them what to do and also separate each lessons. So we don't want the math lesson being mixed with the science. So use your instruction to state where the lesson begins and how it flows and what will happen in each step. You can also put the objectives of the lesson that will follow throughout the day. And you can always edit your instructions. You can also delete them and you can also copy the link and share it with the students. Also, please do remember that Google Classroom is zero rated. So students, as long as they have been have on the 14 day educational plan and they would have already download Google Classroom to their devices and join the classroom, it won't cost them to explore. It won't cost them any data to explore the classroom unless they'll have to use things outside of the classroom, such as view a YouTube video. If they have to view a YouTube video outside of the classroom, then they'll be required data for that. All right, moving back to the presentation. How can we make Google Classroom experience be in WhatsApp? So our screen is coming up. So how can the Google Classroom experience be shared on WhatsApp? So the experience of the Google Classroom can be shared on WhatsApp and still be conceptual. What we can do is share the links for the task, the content or worksheet posted in the Google Classroom or on WhatsApp, giving students clear instruction by text or voice note. And again, I'll emphasize, ensure that you're, you vet your texts and they are deliberate and aligned with the learning goals. So you don't want the student have to be, I wonder what Miss or Sir expect of me to do. Ensure that the texts are clear and also the voice notes and post pictures of task content or worksheets in the Google Classroom onto WhatsApp, giving students clear instructions by text or voice note as well. I now hand over to my colleague, Miss Dare, who will take us through the printed material. Okay, thank you, Miss Bell. So the printed material um, we're going to look at is really 
the worksheet. So uh, as shown, worksheet should be created to support guided discovery where students are able to follow clear, direct instruction to complete tasks sequentially. Now, I am trying to share a screen here so you can see what the sample worksheet looks like. Now, the worksheet, we want it to be very interactive. We want it to be experimental um, in a form of guided discovery. So remember, you're not face to face with the students. However, it the worksheet should be structured in a way in which it seems as if you're speaking to the child in the classroom. So of course, the, the student will have questions. So you're going to structure your worksheet in such a way in which the questions um, um, would, be, would, would be addressed. So you know the type of students that you have. You know their personality and everything. So you're going to structure your worksheet to facilitate those students. And remember, it's not their fault where they can't be online. And after all, everyone will get the same assessment. So they can't be at a disadvantage. So you want to ensure now that your worksheet um, is conceptual, so it, that it deals with concepts, okay? Now, so at the top, let me know if you're seeing the screen, Miss Bailey. Yes, we're seeing your screen. Okay, so we have this strand, which is measurement, a topic, area, and the grade. And of course, we want to date your worksheet because we want to be accountable, okay? So we don't want teachers to be just printing a page from the textbook and say, give it to them, they have work to do. No, you have to teach these students too. So, we are trying to fill the gap. Remember, we are trying to fill the gap, bridge the gap. So we're going to select objectives from the previous grade. So we are currently looking at grade five. So we choose objective from grade four because remember we are merging the objectives. All right. So here we have use unit of squares and then we have from grade four and then we have develop relationship between the units from grade five. You want to write the material you want to give a little content to, because they must know what they are doing. Now, just as how when you are um, writing your lessons and you include your five E's, that's how we want the worksheet to be done. So, of course, you're going to have an engagement activity. You give them a nice little picture or so forth, something colorful to capture their attention, because you know how students are. They will look at the worksheet and locks. They have an instant headache. Or they say, what is that? You know, you want it to be um, student friendly. So um, here we use a picture and we say, look close that figure one above. How much of the surface of the tabletop do you think this figure would cover? And so forth. Um, of course, they have questions to answer. My screen is jumping up and down. But, so they'll have some questions to answer after you ask them that. So it's a follow-up, it's a step-by-step -step activity. Now, so you say, were you able to say how much surface is covered? You give them the option, yes or no. Remember, it's like you're talking to them face-to-face. -face. If yes, how did, how did you go about finding how much surface is covered? And so forth. Also, um, teachers who want to solicit the, the help of solicit the help of parents, responsible parents. So you write the objectives, you're going to write your worksheet in a way with the parents to those who are helpful. If they're helping their child, they can follow, they can read and comprehend, and even they will learn too. You don't want the parents to be calling the school to say, my child don't understand and what is this and what is that and so forth, all right? You want to make the, the, the worksheet attractive as we said already as I have said already. Um, so you would say, you would have found the area of the tabletop covered by multicolored fabric by counting the number of squares. So you give them information, you feed them with information. 
So it's just like you're in the classroom talking. So you, you ask them a question, whether they were able to answer it yes or no, you would give the response, you would give the correct response to them. All right, here we give a model. So here they are expected to use the grid paper. If they, if they don't have any grid paper at home, the child will say, I can't do the work because see there. But then you would provide the model so the child would not have any excuse, okay? Here we also have a table. So the instructions would follow, but here we have a table and we have done the table in such a way in which it's sequential. So when the length of a square is one centimeter, one centimeter, the square represents one squared centimeter. So one centimeter by one centimeter equal one square centimeter. And here now they would follow. So it's, it's a sequence. I don't know why this is jumping up and down. So it's a sequence. So you, you, you guide them along the way, all right? Now, uh, we also want to have stages of activities. So at the first stage, you engage them, you make it a little easy. And at the other stage, you put a little more uh, rigor to it. Not difficult, remember, not difficulty, but a little complexity and so forth, so that they would move from each stage to another. And um, in so doing, they would also get the concepts meanwhile doing that. All right, so you want to show them also a little model. You want to say, did your shape look like this and so forth. Um, earlier, we also looked at, by using the virtual manipulative, we look at counting the squares in order to find the area. Now, they are not fortunate enough to have the virtual manipulative, so therefore you have to provide other means. So you give them model just the same. So they should not be short of anything. That's what we are saying, okay? Also bear in mind that we are preparing the students for the PEP exam and the PEP have different components. So while you give an activity for the curriculum base, you also want to give one for the PT, the performance task. Hence, you want to structure your question in such a way that it relates to real life situation. So at the end of the day, whether the child was privileged to have online access or it was just drop off material, then the child would have been equipped to perform well in the exam given. All right, so also we want to give a little reflection. So at the end of the lesson, you ask some questions because you want to know if they really did it or if they got help, because some persons will ask for help and don't do anything, you know. So you have to ensure that they did the, the work. Also, at the back of your worksheet, you also want to give them the answers. You want to provide them with the answers. Because remember, when you're in the class, you would have provided them with the answers. And so by providing the answers, you now the students will be able to look back and see if they, are, if they were correct or not. And also the parents are who, who serve as guiding the students. Some here you may say they will look on the answer before doing um, the worksheet. Not a problem. You only want to know that the worksheet is being completed. Okay. Thank you very much. I now hand over back to Mrs. Kuhu. She left off. Basically, she was at the end of the worksheet where she was um, referring to using reflection, giving the students um, questions in order for them to reflect on what they would have done. And also, after they have completed this work, to check it with the answer sheet that is provided. Now, as we pull the curtains down on this presentation, our encouragement to you, always seek to teach mathematics conceptually, whether teaching online, face-to-face, -face, or with printed materials, to avoid students' misconceptions, because misconceptions are sometimes quite difficult to correct. And as you seek to engage the students online, we have prepared for you some 
virtual manipulatives that you can help to make this learning experience be meaningful. So there we have some links that you can go to to access